hear me? I've got voice. No, 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 can't hear me. Uh, we've lost the man. He's gone. <laughs> He's gone. Thanks, that's good. So testing, testing, one, two, three, got that. So the meeting tonight, I'm going to be talking about the mind. In fact, some writers claim that nine-tenths of all diseases are in the mind. So how does disease happen in the mind? I read an interesting statement once. It said, many might be well if only they thought so. Many might be sick if only they thought so. In Australia, you might have heard of our uh, dark-skinned uh, people who were there first, <laughs> so to speak, which is the Aboriginal people. Now, the Aboriginal culture had a practice that it was called pointing of the bone. And if someone had done something worthy of death, the elders of the tribes would point the bone at this person and within 24 hours, they would be dead. Now, there was no magical properties in the bone. The person believed that they would die, and they did. Unfortunately, pointing of the bone is still happening. How often have I met people who've told me that they've been given six months to live, and they live for six months? You know, sometimes medicine makes mistakes. That's why if ever a person's told they've got so long to live and they tell that to me, the first thing I say is, have you rejected that? Have you rejected it? <laughs> Proverbs 23 verse 7, I think we know it. It says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And most people don't realise that happiness is a choice. It's a choice. And we have no right not to be happy. You see, feelings are a very bad guide because feelings go up and down like the wind. Is that right? I remember when I was living in the rainforest, we had no electricity. <laughs> Things didn't happen quickly because my first husband was a drug addict and an alcoholic. And he'd put up a bit of a clothesline for me from tree to tree. And we'd had a lot of rain and I was so happy to finally be able to get my washing on the line and the rope break, the rope break, broke, rope broke, that's it. <laughs> the rope broke and all my washing fell in the mud. And I sat down and cried. And then I got up and fixed it. <laughs> you see, things happen. And you might say, Barbara, that's really not a big deal. Well, when you've got a whole lot of children and <laughs> you've had many days of rain. Do you know it's important to grieve when something bad happens? Mm -hmm. And I allowed myself a few minutes grieving <laughs> and then got up and did something about it. And when there's been a loss, grieving is important. Unfortunately, I have met people, it's five years later and they're still grieving. Now, if I sat under that tree and grieved for five years about my washing life... <laughs> and yes, you might say, Barbara, how can you compare washing falling in the mud compared to the loss of a loved one? Yes, the loss of a loved one certainly is major. But the fact is, we've all got to die. Is that right? And in most cases, and not in every case, the way we die is determined by the way we live. Obviously there are accidents. Obviously sometimes things happen that, that we have no say of over. But my father passed a week and a half ago and he'd been a vegetarian most of his life. He didn't drink and he didn't smoke. And I would say about four or five days before he died I was talking on the phone to him and we had a, we had a great conversation. <laughs> How nice that the mind is still working right up until the day that we die. And so at his funeral, a few people talked 
And then I stood up and said, I believe that we are all here today as a celebration, yeah? A celebration of quite an amazing life. My father was a pilot, he was an inventor. He spent his retiring years inventing attachments for bicycles and all sorts of things for disabled people. In fact, it wasn't till the funeral that a lot of us realised how much he had done. 50 bikes <laughs> he had made attachments for. So though my father has gone, um, I allowed myself a little bit of grieving, but I thought, my father has now passed and he led a very good life and what a wonderful thing to have made a, a difference to humanity. Isn't that what our life is all about? So the reason I'm talking about these things to you is because many are sick because of grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt and distrust. And in the little book Ministry of Healing, she says that grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust all tend to break down the life forces and invite decay and death into the body. Oh, but aren't these just feelings? Do you know they are feelings? And most people don't realise that we have more control over our feelings than we think we do. So what I'd like to do, I'd like to show you where all these things are happening and they're all happening in our mind. So I'm going to break up the brain into two parts and I found a thicker pen. The front part of the brain is called the frontal lobe. Now if you want to know what your brain looks like, look at a, look at a walnut. I think God's got a sense of humour because the fats that are in the walnut are used specifically for brain function. It's called omega-3. Have you heard of that? In the frontal lobe part of the brain, this is where our reasoning powers reside. It's in the frontal lobe part of the brain where our intellect is. It's in the frontal lobe part of the brain where judgment takes place. And it's in the frontal lobe part of the brain where our will is. Our will is the decision part. And I read a little book called Steps to Christ. I've read it several times actually. And on page 57 it's got the best description of the will that I have ever read. The author says, what we need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man. It is the power of decision or of choice. And the power of choice God gave to man, it is theirs to exercise. You cannot change your heart. And you cannot of yourself give to God its affections, but you can choose to serve him. You can give him your will. He will then work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Through the right action of the will, an entire change can be made in the life. You see, God is not in every man. You would never say God was in Hitler, Mugabe. No, no, no. God gave mankind choice. And it was God's desire that we choose to serve him according to our reason, intellect and judgment. You see, the back part of the brain is where our feelings are. And I believe that the enemy of souls, the devil, tempts us through our feelings. So I call the feelings a bad boss. They're not bad, but they don't make a good boss. Whereas the front part of the brain is a very good boss. You see, every decision that this boss makes is made according to reason, intellect and judgment. I was reading the story, the account of when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. He fasted for 40 days. Now, I was a bit hungry when I went to bed last night because I'd worked hard yesterday evening. But I said to myself, get over it, go to sleep. You're not in a concentration camp. You had <laughs> good meals today. Do you ever speak to your feelings like that? 
But if I said to myself, I'm so hungry, I'm never going to be able to sleep, guess what? I'm never going to be able to sleep. And who's the boss there? It's my feelings. But I had frontal lobe come in and say, look, you're about to go to sleep and when you're asleep you don't know if you're hungry or not. Is that right? <laughs> I woke up this morning at five o'clock and as is my habit, I prayed and read my Bible and I went through my memory verses in my mind. It's just like learning to play a piano. You've got to go over them and over them and over them. Did you know that a concert pianist will practice for five hours a day for two weeks before one performance? How much are you prepared to put into this? <laughs> That's just for a concert pianist. If you go over and over, these things will stay in your mind. And I was starting to get a little hungry, so I drank some more water. And then my walking partner came into my room about a little bit past seven. I was getting very hungry. <laughs> and I said to Feelings, settle down, it'll come. And we went on a great walk. And my walking partner said, will we go a little further? I said, no, let's go back. <laughs> We did probably a little more than half an hour. And I was so hot that I dived in the, in the sea. Oh, that was wonderful. So when I come back, I'm not in any fit state to go and sit at a table to eat my breakfast. So I said to my walking partner, I'll be three minutes. So I ran upstairs and I had a quick shower. The whole time my, my feelings, my stomach saying, I want to eat. And I'm saying, settle down, it's coming. <laughs> You see, this is a good boss. Mm -hmm. This is a very good boss. And when I sat to eat, I ate well and I very much enjoyed, enjoyed my meal. That's a very simple illustration of this dialogue that happens between the good boss and the bad boss. We're all familiar with it, aren't we? Now the Bible talks about how Jesus appeals to us and how he knocks at our reason, intellect and judgment. And it's described in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, where the Bible says, it's Jesus talking, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, he says, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Beautiful illustration of the intimacy with which God wants to know us. Didn't we have a night nice tonight eating together? And isn't that what you do when you meet with friends? I don't usually have much to eat at night and I had a light evening meal tonight because I had a hearty lunch. But when I meet friends and we're going to go out to dinner, I try and get in the restaurant early. <laughs> but isn't it so nice to eat together? Do you know the Bible gives a picture of another force and it's found in 1 Peter 5. And I'll start with verse 6 where it says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God. How do we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God? It's a choice. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due season, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Notice the next verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, knowing that your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeing whom he can devour. Whom resist? Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that, that are in the world. Now notice those two forces. The roaring lion, where does he tempt us? On our feelings. And then the gentle saviour. He is such a gentleman. He will never force. He stands at the door and knocks and says, if any man hear my voice and open the door. How do we open the door? We open the door by our decision. I remember when I first met some young people who lived next door to me who were Christians. And I loved what they had. And I said, how do you get it? And they said, just ask Jesus to come into your heart. I said, oh. So when I was alone, I'd say, um, Jesus, come into my heart. Nothing would happen. And I thought, how do, how do you get this? How, how do you know God? I, I couldn't understand it. And I read a book called Your Bible Anew, and it's by Arthur 
um, Arthur Maxwell. And it explains the Bible. It explains how it was written. It explains how so many authors and yet everything knits together because God wrote it. It talked about different doctrines. My mother had died six months ago and I thought she was floating around watching me. That's what I learnt as a Presbyterian in Sunday school. And then I read how when we die, we go to sleep. Oh, that is such a kind doctrine. My mother's not floating around watching me, getting upset when, when things go hard for me. Such a kind doctrine. Oh, I couldn't put this book down. <laughs> and then it talked about the Sabbath as the seventh day. I always thought the Sabbath was Sunday. And then I counted the days on the calendar, the seventh day. It's Saturday. My eyes were opened. Can you see that through my reason, intellect and judgment, I was actually starting to open the door. I was discovering things that excited me. I found the truth. And I'm sure we know that verse that says, the truth shall set you free. I got to the part of the book where it had an illustration of Jesus knocking on the door of our heart. I got down on my knees and I gave my whole life to God. And when I stood up and sat back on the lounge, my first husband, who was a drug addict and an alcoholic, he walked into the room, looked at me and just kept walking. He was going to another room. I thought, my first miracle. If he'd come in and see me on my knees, he would have got so angry. He didn't want me to become a Christian. He didn't want me to read the Bible. At first I had to hide it. Do you know, peace came into my heart, a peace that I had never known. And then when I read the little book, Steps to Christ, that says you cannot change your heart, you cannot of yourself give to God its affections, but you can choose to serve him. I then understood. Can you see God appeals to us? He communicates with us through our reason, intellect and judgment, our frontal lobe. Isaiah 118, the Bible says, come let us reason together. <laughs> That's where it happens. I was 26 when this happened. Do you know, it's the best decision I have ever made in my life. I had no idea what was ahead. And God isn't so good not to show us what's ahead, am I right? Very much so. It was the best thing that I've ever found. And my grandmother was a Christian. She died at 99. And she had memorized great portions of scripture. So I began little by little to memorize. In fact, the first verse I memorized is in Philippians where it says, in nothing be anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be known to God. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Notice the thanksgiving. I nearly forgot it. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the Bible says, In everything give thanks. Do you know this keeps our mind? I've broken my leg. Thank you, Father. <laughs> I don't like it. But when I say thank you, I'm saying I don't like it. I wish it wasn't broken. But I believe that out of this broken leg, God's going to teach me some things that maybe I would never have learned any other way. It's a way that you see it. That's why happiness is a choice. And I have taught myself, and you can rewire your brain, and in another other meeting I'll go into that in more detail, and I'm touching on it now. You can rewire your brain, and I have taught myself, I have trained myself that when anything goes wrong, I laugh. You know, it's a great idea. <laughs> and practice makes perfect, and practice makes permanent, and repetition is the mother of retention, and repetition deepens the impression. <laughs> there is another saying, it says, fake it till you make it. <laughs> Do you know it's a good idea? Things are going wrong, start laughing. I don't feel like laughing. Your, your feelings are a bad boss. Don't go there. Just start going like this. Ha, 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 ha. There. You'll start laughing once you do that. 
There's another verse in the Bible that gives another aspect to this and it's found in 2 Corinthians 10 verse, I think it starts at a verse about 3 or 4. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Do you know what that means? The weapons aren't flesh and blood. They're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Do you know we have the ability to do that? So when those feelings come that are wrong, cast them down. Pulling down of strongholds. So if there are negative feelings that are binding you, pull down those strongholds, casting down those imaginations. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You see, these feelings are like a wild horse and God has given us a bridle. God has given us reins. Here it is. It's the frontal lobe. So when those feelings arise and you think they're not good, bind them up. Bring them into captivity through the power of Christ. When you give your frontal lobe to God, you have got a power, a power that's beyond human, that'll give us the ability to hold that. You see, the devil tempts us here. And in James chapter 1, verse 13, the Bible says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. So that defines it. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Because God cannot be tempted with evil. Every man is tempted when he is drawn, as, drawn apart by his own lusts. <laughs> That's the lust. And lust, when it is conceived, brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. No, it is not God that is tempting you. It is another power. So when we give this frontal lobe to God, we have a power that will enable us to conquer those feelings. Now what also happens is we get into the habit of feeling down. Do you know what that means? We get into the habit of feeling happy. We can get into the habit of laughing. And I know when I lived in the rainforest, Sometimes my first husband would get very angry and he would yell and I would get very upset and I would cry. And my little William would come into me and I learnt to smile while I was crying. Have you ever tried it? Because I knew that if my little one saw me smiling, it was a sign to him, what? It's all right. It's all right. I remember one day he came in and said, Mum, Next time Dad yells at you, run into the bush. <laughs> this little one trying to help his mother. I held myself together because I had six pairs of eyes on me. Mm -hmm. How did I do that? Casting down imaginations by the power of God and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So every morning, every morning, I do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says. Sorry, not 7, we're starting at 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due season. So every morning, I surrender my frontal lobe to the great God of heaven, because it's a choice. It's a choice. Now there are two verses in the Bible that talk about the frontal lobe. But before I share them with you, let me explain the feelings once more. They're like a wild horse and they need the bridle. They need the reins. And this is the bridle. This is the reins, your frontal lobe. That's how come you can cast down your imaginations. You can bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now let's say, I say to a man, I say to him, could you take this wild horse for a half hour ride? 
He's only just being run in, so he's a little bit wild. Eight hours later, the man returns. I said, what's, what's going on? He said, well, the horse wanted to go up there and it wanted to go down and it wanted to go up the other mountain. And I said, what do you think the bridle's for, mate? Pull it in. <laughs> your bridle is your frontal lobe. Your feelings and your thoughts are going to go all over the place. When everything's going right, we, uh, it, it's not hard, is it? <laughs> it's when everything goes wrong. Yeah? When everything goes wrong, that's when we're most tempted. Now, if you've got a voice that's accusing you, you're an idiot, you're no good, no one likes you, you can't do anything, you're stupid, I don't know if you get those voices. They come into my mind sometimes. The Bible tells us who it is. In Revelation 12, I think it's about verse 8, eight or 9, where it says that the accuser of our brethren is cast down, and it defines it. It says that that... In fact, let me do the whole lot because it's so good. We'll, we'll start at verse 7. And it says there was war in heaven. Did you know that? There was war in heaven and Michael and his angels. Michael is another name for Jesus. And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, praise God. And prevailed not. Neither was there found any more place for them in heaven. So that's um, verse 7, verse 8. This is verse 9. That great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So that defines who it is, which deceiveth the whole world. Notice what he uses. Deception. What's deception? Not as it appears. Got that? Often in books, Satan is drawn like he's got a pitchfork and horns. Do you know the Bible says he comes as an angel of light? No one would look at him if he had a pitchfork and horns. Eh? An angel of light. He was cast out. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the power of our God and the, sorry, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. So can you see those verses define who's the accuser? That great dragon, that old serpent, the devil and Satan. He's the accuser of our brethren. He's cast down, which accuses them before our God day and night. Do you know what that means? He's not even sleeping. So when those voices come, they come through here. What do you do when they come? Do you listen to them? Do you believe them? No. You are so important that if there was no one else on this planet, Jesus would have died for you. For you. And I love Galatians uh, 2.22. Galatians 2.22 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And the life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see how wonderful memorizing is? Who loved me and gave himself for me. That's just me. <laughs> That's just you. That is the gentle saviour. It's not hard to cast all your care upon him, is it? You see, he knows. He knows how many hairs are on our head. He knows the way that we take. Trust him. Give it all to him. When I understood that, it allowed me to surrender all to God. It's so important to do that because once you do that, you've got that power. So let me give you the verses now. They're in the Psalms that talk about this bridal, these reins. One is found in Psalm 16, verse 7. 
Psalm 16 verse 7 says, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night season. My reins. That's why I love early morning, because early morning is where God instructs. My reins also instruct me in the night season. The other psalm is Psalm 39 verse 1 that says, I will take heed to my ways that I earn not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle. <laughs> because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, mouth speaks. Is that right? That's why the war's in here. It's up here. We're going to deal with it up there. And if we don't, things are going to come out of our mouth should, that should never come out of our mouth. And you can never take those words back. Is that right? I will take heed to my ways that I earn not with my tongue. <laughs> I will keep my mouth with a bridle. There's the bridle. Getting upset? Go for a run. <laughs> Have a cold shower. Well, cold shower's not that cold here in Malaysia. <laughs> Have a great glass of water. Don't speak until frontal lobe is again the boss. Mm -hmm. Do you know what takes that frontal lobe down? Dehydration. Late nights. <laughs> Bad food. Coffee. Alcohol. Cigarettes. Ooh. <laughs> takes it down. That's why we've got to do our part. In fact, the Bible talks about armour, and it talks about armour in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, where it says, Finally, brethren, stand firm in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's verse 10. And then verse 11 says, Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's similar, isn't it, to what we just had in 2 Corinthians verse 10. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not here. It's not, <laughs> it's not a physical fight. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, take unto you the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Have you done all? So what does it mean, having done all to stand? Are you well hydrated? Are you going to bed early? Are you getting that technology out of your bedroom or in the far corner? Are you eating nourishing food? Have you stopped the caffeines? Have you stopped the refined sugars, the alcohols, the cigarettes? Having done all. Having done all. We've got to do our part. God gave us the mind. God gave us the reasoning. God gave us the body. We have a part to play. It is not by accident that each one of us are here right now. But we had a part to play in getting here. Is that right? Have you done all? Having done all to stand. Having your loins girt about with truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. Truth's a mighty thing, isn't it? And that's what I am giving to you is truth. Because there's a deceiver out there. What did Jesus say in... And we know this one well. It's in... John chapter 14, I think it's about verse 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So we're back down to verse 5. And having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of truth. And 6 is, and above all, take the shield of faith. What's the shield of faith? Do you know, faith is the substance of things hoped for, says Hebrews 11 verse 1, the evidence of things not seen. We can't see our Saviour, but he's given us so much evidence. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. He could not do more than he has done. Having the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Do you know he's throwing fiery darts at you? 
Where does he throw the darts? In here. You're an idiot. You're no good. No one loves you. You've never been any good. You're hopeless. Are they darts? How can we quench those darts? The shield of faith. Believing that Jesus loves us, that he died to save us. Verse 7, and take the helmet of salvation and the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. Sharpen your sword. And as I shared with you earlier this afternoon, Hebrews 4 Verse 12 says, the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that's not manifest in his sight, for all things are naked and opened before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He knows that. <laughs> Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but who was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly, how? boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in every time of need. We need to take these weapons seriously. Eh? Sharpen your sword. I have not got a good memory. Now you might not believe me <laughs> but the things that I share with you from the word of God I go over and over and over. And God gave us a brain that is such we can do this. Like the concert pianist, like the violinist. They didn't start learning the piano yesterday. They didn't start learning the violin yesterday. It's over and over and over. And do you think it's going to take us any less work to get that precious word of God in our minds so that our swords are sharpened? No. We're up to verse, we've done verse 9. Verse 9 is praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit. Sorry, this is verse 8. Praying always. You see, I hide a number in the word and I've hidden 8 in the S of always. That's how I can remember the number. Play, praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit and watching whereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And the next verse I love. It's verse 9. I love them all. And for me, that utterance may be given me, that I may open my mouth boldly to proclaim the mysteries of the gospel. Because without God, I cannot do that. And the next verse, the final verse, is verse 10, where it says, For the which I am an ambassador in bonds that I may speak boldly that which I ought to speak. The Bible tells us that the war is here. That's where the war is. There was war in heaven and the devil was cast out with his angels. And then if you go down to verse, verse 26, sorry, no, it's verse 17, in verse 17 it says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, the woman in Bible prophecies, the church, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and, met, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So where's the war now, students? <laughs> Us. <laughs> and remember, it's not flesh and blood, it's right here. That's why every morning put your armour on. Put your armour on because remember what it said? The accuser of our brethren who accuses them before our God day and night. <laughs> Would you go into battle with that armour? Many diseases happen in the mind because people do not understand what I've just explained to you this evening. 
They don't realise that there's an enemy out there. They don't realise that those fiery darts that he's throwing into them, because that's what he does, he accuses, we don't have to take. And remember, having the shield of faith, because you can quench all those fiery darts by laughing, by singing, by quoting scripture, by singing um, psalms and hymns. And you can get into the habit of being happy. You can get into the habit of being laugh, of laughing. You can get into the habit of quoting that scripture. If this was properly understood, diseases of the mind would be a rarity. It'd be something like someone fell and hit their head and damaged part of their brain. That, that'd be almost the only time we would see diseases in the mind. Did you know that the pharmaceutical company markets madness? They have created the madness industry. And did you know that antidepressants cause depression? Did you know that the side effects from these drugs are actually intensifying? They might appear to alleviate symptoms, but they do not heal. Drugs never heal. If someone is on antidepressants or some mind-altering legal drugs, they cannot just stop them. First of all, they must implement the eight laws of health, get their mind hydrated, well nourished, well exercised, well slept, limit technology time, totally eliminate any violence, games and videos that are going in. They must take their steps and then read the Bible, surrender the frontal lobe to God and then little by little they can ease off those antidepressants and when they feel a panic attack coming they laugh have a big drink of water and run around the house three times and that panic attack will pass <laughs> the proverb says as a man thinketh in his heart is he if a panic attack comes and a person thinks oh no here comes my panic attack there it goes and if someone feels a panic attack coming on throws their head back laughs out loud, gets a great big drink of water, runs around the house, can't run, gets on the exercise bike, can't exercise bike, get on the rebounder, can't rebounder, have a cold shower. Can you see that? All of those physical things will just help that person to get over the tip of that panic attack. And then little by little, if they do that with every panic attack, they can rewire their brain so that they no longer can get a panic attack. It sounds too simple, doesn't it? Yes. Try it. It is not simple at all. <laughs> Especially when you're in the habit of reacting a certain way. You know the old saying that says, you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Well, they're proving that to be totally wrong. Our brain can be rewired right up until the day we die. God is able. He is able to do mighty things through those that humble themselves under the mighty hand of God because then they will be exalted in due season. Just before we close, are there any questions? We have five minutes. Yes? What you suggest um, help with things like Alzheimer and I have a book in our library, it's called Stop Alzheimer's Now by Dr. Bruce Fife. And Dr. Bruce Fife spends the first few chapters showing that Alzheimer's, dementia, Huntington's career, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis are all due to damage in the brain. It's damage in different parts of the brain. It can be damaged from heavy metals. It can be damaged from chemicals. It can be damaged from um, bad teeth. Do you know bad teeth, especially root canal fillings? You've got no nerve there now, so you don't know it's bad behind it. And those poisons can go through and poison the brain. So the brain can be damaged through poisons. The, can, the brain can be damaged by actually physical falls 
and that famous boxer Muhammad Ali. He had Alzheimer's in the last 20 years of his life because he'd been beaten around the head so much. So remember the page 127 of the Ministry of Healing that I first talked about in my last lecture and it says in the case of sickness the cause needs to be ascertained. So with Muhammad Ali it's too late all the beating was done <laughs> 20 years ago but we are all inquisitive and we want to know why and God put it that made us that way the cause should be ascertained unhealthful conditions changed so if someone's living in a moldy house they've got to get out mold can poison the brain if they've got exposure to chemicals still if they've got bad teeth all of that has to be assessed and then wrong habits corrected so the person's got to stop smoking stop drinking coffee stop drinking alcohol stop their sugar addiction start getting good habits like drinking water going to bed early and then the last ones is nature is to be assisted in her efforts to expel impurities and re-establish right conditions back in the body there is an oil that God made that can heal brain cells and it's called the coconut and in his book depression away uh, sorry stop Alzheimer's now he shows how when we take the coconut oil the liver converts these the, the medium chain fatty acids in the coconut oil to ketones and ketones are neuro healers ketones are neuro protectors what's neuro that's brain cell neuro protectors in his book stop Alzheimer's now he has stories about people who have turned Alzheimer's around in fact it's the best formula that I have ever come across and it's one sentence in case of sickness the cause should be ascertained unhealthful conditions changed wrong habits corrected then nature is to be assisted now depending on the different ailments and you'll see this as we go through these lectures different things would help I don't take coconut oil every meal but if I had any trace of Alzheimer's or any signs I would you start with a teaspoon three times a day and you build up to a tablespoon three times a day of coconut oil and guess what people who are eating that diet don't have heart attacks or strokes because fat doesn't cause heart attacks and strokes and we're going to be doing a lecture on heart where I'll show you that in detail it must be the oil you must have that concentrated it's very very high in medium chain fatty acids and that's the fatty acid that the liver converts to ketones and then neuro healers it's called the ketogenic diet have you heard of the ketogenic diet it was it was basically discovered in the about the 1921 by a group of doctors and they were healing epilepsy with the ketogenic diet now the ketogenic diet traditionally has been high meat high dairy but you can do it by dropping carbohydrates down and having legumes every meal lots of vegetables and supplementing with the coconut oil yes How much coconut oil? start with a teaspoon three times a day and build up to a tablespoon three times a day <coughs> Will that help a person put on weight? Um, if a person can't put on weight, it's more a gut problem. Yeah? It doesn't matter what you do with it. Because it, it has no double bonds on it and in the molecular structure if there's double bonds it's susceptible to light and heat well the coconut doesn't so it doesn't matter what you do with it you can have it in the cupboard for 10 years and it will not deteriorate hmm. it's an amazing oil 
So let's have a break. I'll, I'll close with a prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much again for this amazing body. And we thank you for coming close and teaching us tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>